the first question I want to make is about this new band. Right. Are you excited about it? I'm extremely excited about it. You know, to uh, to go from one band called Thin Lizzy to giving that up for a while to go to another band called Black Star Riders, I, I better be excited about it or, I'll ma or I'm making a terrible mistake here, <laughs> which I don't think I am. <laughs> okay. And when did the, this idea come to your mind? In the first well, place? It, it, it came about because uh, uh, we were writing uh, material for a new album, and uh, it, in the beginning, we were thinking of making making it the next Thin Lizzy album, right? but as we got more and more and further and further into the writing, I became increasingly uncomfortable with the idea of it of it being a Thin Lizzy album and Phil Lynott not there. That made me really uncomfortable. And I talked to Brian Downey, the drummer, and he said, "You know, I'm feeling the same way, right?" So we went to Ricky and. Uh, uh, Damon and we talked to him about it and they said yeah we're kind of feeling that uh, also so we, uh, we were all thinking the same thing but now we're on the same page and the idea of now was we've got 18 songs what are we going to do with these 18 songs we really want to record these things and put it into an album so really the only thing we could do was pull Thin Lizzy up to a certain point and then walk away from it for a while and start a new band so we can get these songs down and, uh, and into a CD form, and, and that's what we did. So walking away for a while, it means that you will reunite Thin Lizzy? Well, and, yeah, I mean, you, it's not that we're never going to be do Thin Lizzy again. What we'll do is we'll come out for you know special shows, or we'll do a special uh, run, you know, limited time, kind of a, a Thin Lizzy thing, but always go back to Black Star Riders. Okay. Um, the first thing I noticed listening to your new record is that it so heavy is much heavier than I've ever thought and was it <laughs> your decision is there a production thing about it is just the way the band is moving yeah you know there was there was no uh, conscious effort to make the album sound one way or the other you know it's uh, uh, basically what it is you're hearing a live album uh, you know, four musicians playing live in the studio because we it really we just brought our live setup, plonked it down in the studio. So no overdubs. It was just well, no, the, yeah, there, there was you know some of the harmony guitars got overdubbed, uh -huh. uh, the background vocals got overdubbed, but uh, Ricky's vocals are all done right there, right on the spot. Uh, most of the guitar solos that you'll hear are done right on the spot. So it was kind of a scary thing, really. You know, <laughs> none of it's. None of us had ever done an album like that. And especially in, in the amount of time that we had, we only had 12 days to do 12 songs. And none of us had ever recorded like that before. So you, know, you usually want to take a month, you, you know, you'll do the basic track, and I'll come back to that, I'll put a little guitar on it, you know, let me think about this. There was no thinking about it. The drummer countered you in and boom, you finished that track that day, because tomorrow you're working on track two. <laughs> So the pre there was a lot of pressure, but it was a lot of fun too. And listening to it, I feel that there's kind of old Thin Lizzy's vibe and kind of new and yeah. modern feelings. Do you agree with that? Well, yeah, to a certain degree. Uh, I mean, if, if you think about it, I've been in Thin Lizzy since 1974, so I'm going to drag a bit of that with me no matter where I go. You know, Ricky's been. Uh, singing exclusively Thin Lizzy for the last three years, so he's going to bring a bit of that with him. Damon has been a Thin Lizzy fan since he was like that big, right? So he's going to bring some of that too. Right? And the same with Jimmy DeGrasso. So it's kind of inevitable that some of this stuff is going to have a Lizzy-esque type of feel or sound to it, right? Uh, it wasn't on a conscious level. It, we, it wasn't like a premeditated kind of thing. We got up to sound like Thin Lizzy. It wasn't like that at all. You know, it's just it came out the way it came out with sort of little effort of thinking about what we're going to sound like, you know. So, Are you the main songwriter? No. No, we all write. Everybody writes it in the band. The, I'd say probably the, the main glory for all this probably goes to both Damon and Ricky because they just, as soon as I gave the green light for the recording, bang, they just jumped on it. <laughs> and they did a great job. I'm credited to about five of the songs out of the uh, 12. Yeah, I think that 
yeah, the main quality and the first thing yeah. you hear when you're listening about you playing or Thin Lizzy or uh, the Black Star Riders is the harmony guitar parts. And do you see any new band that you could relate to? You could say, oh, they learned the lesson? Well, you know, the harmony guitar thing isn't a new thing. Uh, I've had so many people mistakenly say, well, you were the guys that invented it. And it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> we didn't invent this. I mean, Les Paul and Larry, uh, Mary Ford were doing it back in the 40s, you know. The Eagles did it. The Allman Brothers did it. The only thing that we did differently is we put it in the rock arena and with minor chords and all that. that, that that's, that's where the difference lies. Right? The, you know, if it has... Influenced other players to want to do that kind of thing. Then great, you know. Then that means people were paying attention and listening to it. So I got no problem with that at all. Uh, I'm sure it's kind of an inevitable thing, especially these days. If you have two guitar players, it, it's kind of a given that at some point you're going to do the harmony guitar thing because right? it, it's if it, it's a fun thing to do and when you can, when you can get a clever bit weaving in and out the chord patterns it feels really nice and it, and it listens to really nice so so it, if it's if we were in any way involved in influencing the younger guys then great i'm all for it uh, have you studied guitar or no. because no, i'm, I'm self-taught and so how did you kind of develop your Attitude to the obvious guitar harmony that I think is not the first thing that came to mind of a guitar player no. while he's playing. No, well, it, it, to tell you the truth, it came as an accident. Uh, we were in the uh, the studio. I think it was on the second album, the Fighting album, <clears throat> and Brian Robertson was going to go in and just put a single line down, and I was going to go in and probably just double it. Right? But the engineer mistakenly <laughs> put a some sort of millisecond delay on his guitar when it fed back it fed back in harmony of course he went oh, oh geez I'm, I'm sorry and I went no listen to that that sounds actually pretty cool so we had Brian go out and redo his line and then I learned the harmony line and that became the harmony line in that particular song and I said well I've got another line in the other song here why don't we do the same thing and we then we Went to the next song and did the same thing there. Not really thinking it was a, a sound, you know, or a Thin Lizzy thing. It was just a cool thing to put on these couple of songs. Right? But on the next album, it was like, you know that thing we did on the last album? <laughs> Let's try that again, because I got a cool part. And, and now we're actually kind of writing harmony guitar parts for, for, the, for the next album. Right? So it became a, a thing for me and Brian. And, the album would come out and it would be you know the critics would look at it and it you know one of the I remember one of the reviews said and that patented twin guitar harmony sound of Thin Lizzy and I went hey man we got a sound man how cool is that <laughs> <laughs> so it just became this this thing you know so I mean it, it wasn't it, we didn't mean it to happen but it just kind of happened out of nowhere and how does it work between you and Damon while you are writing, while you are deciding who's gonna play something. Yeah, that's always an interesting bit, isn't it? <laughs> Who gets to do what, where, and why yeah. are you doing? How come I'm not doing it? But it's uh, that all kind of happens in rehearsal. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, when the solo section comes up, uh, I'll take a solo. He'll take a solo. Uh, we'll figure out between the both of us, you know, who's actually grabbing uh, the part best. Or maybe there's, you know, it's so easy with me and Damon, you know, like I'll say, Damon, I, you know, I really want to play the lead on this. Go, yeah, sure, go ahead. Man. Or I'll say, listen, Damon, you should grab that one, man. You're going to you're gonna kick the shit out of that solo, right? Sure, I got that. There's no, get out of here, you know, get out of your bum. <laughs> there's none of that. You know, it's uh, it's all pretty evenly spaced. I mean, if you listen to the album, there's, there's it's about 50-50, you know, solo wise on the album, so... We're all grown up enough not to fight about it. <laughs> and what about the setup? Which amplifiers are you using? I, I'm now playing the uh, Angle Amps. I've, I've played them now for about five years. Uh, I've played Marshalls for 30 years. But uh, I ran into a problem one night at uh, Wembley Arena 
and there was a, an angle rep there that for three weeks he'd been trying to get me to to try the app and I kept no 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 but my my two app heads said inexplicably blown up and I had not I mean we were in 30 minutes we were gonna play to 12,000 people so I was kind of panicking and the angle guy was sitting right there and I said all right you're on put it up let's see what you got <laughs> And he did, he put it up and dialed it in. I hit a couple of chords and went, wow. And played a bit of uh, lead and all that and went, wow. And by this time, my amps were fixed. And I said, nah, you know something, I'm going to play the, the angles tonight. And from that point on, I've used them ever since. Um, the model is the Blackmore scene. Yes, yeah, the Richie Blackmore. Okay. But I get my own, my personalized plates on the front of uh, my amps. So. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> And what about the guitar? I know you used uh, Gibson Les Paul Deluxe. You're Long time ago. Yeah, you're, you've been using uh, Fender Strat, and now you're using Les Paul Axis. The Axis, right? yeah. So what brought you to change this? Video? Well, you know, I walked into the Gibson offices one day, and in one office, right in the middle of the floor, stood this Gibson with a Floyd Rose uh, vibrato system on it. And now, I, now I'm kind of used to the vibrato system because of the Strat, right? But I kind of backed up and thought, whoa, man, a, a Les Paul with a vibrato system? How, how do, what's going on here, right? And I picked it up, and I loved the weight of it. I mean, it's, it's a nice light guitar, and, and uh, it had a nice neck on it. But the, you know, the whole vibrato system really intrigued me. And I fig figured why, how they're able to do that. It's got a flat surface now instead of the violin thing, right? But, you know, I just, uh, I told David Bauer Gibson, I said, I don't want one of these, man. I fucking need one of these things. <laughs> so uh, I'm endorsed by uh, uh, Gibson now with uh, exclusively for the Access guitars. Are we going to see a Scott Garham signature guitar? Or? Well, probably not on the Access, but maybe on uh, one of my other guitars that's been talked about. But, you know, we'll see what, what happens there. You know. Because I know... I don't know, uh, Steve Ray Vaughan has got his number one, Eric Clapton has got his blackie. Have you got Ooh, Man, you're talking about iconic guys. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> what, you too? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be. <laughs> um, have you got your number one guitar? Or Well, there, there's a guitar that I absolutely love and love with, and it's, it's the one that Gibson might be interested in. It's my 1957 uh, Les Paul Standard. Right? It's it's the one from uh, the Jailbreak album on I used on on every single album, and I absolutely love that guitar to death. The problem being, because it's a 1957, it's so expensive now. I don't dare take it out on the road, you know. So it's it stays in the lockup, safely tucked away with the 59, you know. And it, it's really a shame because you know those they they really are beautiful sounding guitars, but you now you can't play them live anymore. It's like, wow. But, you know, the access comes pretty close, so I'm okay. There. I'm feeling good about that. Are you using stun boxes? Or uh, yeah, I use, uh, you know, I've pared everything down. I used to have that big refrigerator full of blanking lights and flashing this and hands coming out and doing nasty things to it. But right now, I'd say I use a Dunlop Wawa -Wa pedal, a capstan uh, uh, delay box, uh, uh, a retro uh, uh, chorus pedal, and uh, you know a little kind of di distortion unit that's pretty much turned all the way down. It just gives you a little 10 dB boost, okay. right? And that's that's about it. Uh, I like I say, I've I've knocked all that stuff on the head, all the, the craziness, because you can go nuts with pedals these days. <laughs> you know, back in the day in the 70s, you had nothing. There's nothing to choose from. You, know, you had your one little orange box, and, and that was it. Today, I mean, you could fill the whole floor with it. So you're one of the guys that keeps changing, keeps trying new stem boxes, or you just uh, find it? Only uh, if, if I hear somebody sound, and I go, man, what are you using there? I really got to try that. But I, I won't go into the music shops and say, all right, line them up. Let's see what you got. Bring them on. You know? <laughs> I, I won't do that. I have to actually hear somebody in action, too, and it has to really kind of hit me before I go searching for that one. Okay. I'm lazy. <laughs> <laughs>
and do you use the angle amps and the X's on the record? Have you used any other things? No, that was it. That's what I mean. We just used, all of us just used our live setup for the uh, uh, recording and, and, and that was it. Okay. Um, we just wanted to see if we could do this, <laughs> you know. And um, talking about live situation, are you going to tour? Are you, are you planning some dates? Are you... Well, we are. I, I know for a fact the official start date for the Black Star Riders is uh, June 1st. And it'll be one of the festivals. But uh, rest assured, we're going to do two or three warm-up shows before we get to those 50,000 audience type of things, you know. Because it's a brand new band with brand new material, so we, we need to kind of feed ourselves in there a little bit, you know, before all the chaos hits. <laughs> and are you thinking about including some... The some yeah. 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 I think most people are going to expect us to play at least a couple of songs. Uh, you know, like in the warm-up shows also, you, it'll be an hour and a half set. We don't have an hour and a half of Black Star Writer songs yet, so we'll have to fill it out a bit with uh, some Thin Lizzy songs. And Hey, we're doing pretty good, so why not? You know? <laughs> Are you thinking about coming back to Italy? Yes. Uh, I was just saying today, you know, back in the 70s, we got kind of banned from Italy. The government really wouldn't let us in. Uh, yeah, there was, there was problems with different concerts over here and riots would happen and the government really didn't want to know about that. So they took a look at us and went, you're definitely not coming in. <laughs> So we really missed out uh, on Italy all those years. So now um, it's, there, it's really liberal and everybody's great and the government's okay, man. And we're going to come over here on a regular basis now, thank God. 